Good afternoon, Community Praise Church. This is the day that the Lord has made and we've come to rejoice and be glad in it on this first Sabbath of February, 2022. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we're grateful that you've called us to this place to worship. You've called us even virtually. And so I pray that you would move from heart to heart, from mind to mind, from house to house, that we would be inspired and challenged and changed that the worship we experience today would transform us and that we would go forth to tell the world about Jesus and to tell them about your wondrous love. So God, have your way in Jesus' name, amen. Again, it's my joy to welcome you to the very first Sabbath of February, the first Sabbath of Black History Month, that month that we celebrate every year, the great things that God has done through the lives of black people. And Black History Month isn't just for black people, it is American history, it is world history. And if you're like me, you like to celebrate it year round. And so I'm so grateful that God is doing marvelous things in our lives and marvelous things in this church. Before I tell you what's going on for worship today, would you just take a minute and hit like and subscribe and share. Partner with us by joining us on all of our social media platforms. That's Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. You can find us on all of those platforms at CPC SDA. That's CPC SDA on all social media platforms. Hit that bell so you can stay up to date with what's going on at the Community Praise Church. Today, on this first Sabbath of Black History Month, we are super thrilled that we're able to engage in worship virtually together. Tim is going to lead us in praise and worship with our other praise leaders, and it's going to be outstanding. I'm gonna lead you in prayer before the throne of grace. And we're blessed today to have Pastor Lola Moore Johnston, the lead pastor of RPC, is here to share with us her phenomenal gift in song. Not only is she a powerful preacher of righteousness, but she's a phenomenal song a singer as well. And so Dr. Johnston is going to share her ministry with us. And then today I get to begin a series entitled Church Redefined with a message under the title, Risky Business. All of this is, is to lead us into a new focus of ministry. The landscape of ministry has changed for the last couple of years and I pray that God is leading us to greater ministry in 2022. But on this first Sabbath of Black History Month, we have a very special treat. You know, we always start with the children's story. Well, before we get there, I want you to take a minute and hear what these amazing kids had to say about Black History Month. Take a look, uh, take a look and see. Hello. Black History Month is um, a commemoration, vocab word, for black activists, another vocab word, who took took their time out to go fight, um, fight for what, what they feel is right. Like Martin Luther King had a speech that violence is not the answer and no segregation. We celebrate black people that helped us change history. It reminds us to be strong even in politics. Oy. What matters is what, what's inside of you and how you act to other people. Doesn't matter if you're black, if you're white, should always celebrate it because you know the, the the struggles black leaders went through in order for you to be here right now. Even though we may have the different skin color, we're still the same type of people, no matter what. And a lot of people, they don't see me for who I am. They see my outside appearance, but they don't see what I have on the inside. It's very hard to grow up knowing that you're black and you have a lot of personal prejudice against you. I see it on the TV and I'm like, is that gonna happen to my brother? Is that, is that gonna happen to my dad? And I always have that in the back of my mind every time that I'm home and they're not home. Black history is important to me because I have to remember where I came from and I have to remember who came before me. Because you have to look at the things that Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and um, Malcolm X did for us black people so people can't treat us unfairly because they think some type of belief. Because we're, we are all people and you need to stand up for our rights. There's still discrimination, there's still discrimination in all parts of the world, in all parts of the United States. We should still fight for what we believe and we should still fight for getting what's right. Wow, wasn't that incredible? They are such amazing children and they inspire all of us. In fact, I want you to understand for all of our kids that God has placed something powerful in your life. 
Not only do you get to carry on the legacy of so many people that have gone before us, of the Rosa Parks and, and Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X and, and Harriet Tubman and all of the others, Frederick Douglass, so many. I'll, I'll get in trouble if we start trying to list them all. But God has called you to carry it on, to do the same and greater. God has placed so much in you, each one of you amazing, intelligent, independent, wonderful children. And God is calling you to do the same work in greater ways with your own life. So as we get started for worship today, it is time for our children's story. And Leslie Ann had on her heart that in this time where so many of our children are being affected uh, by, by the loss of loved ones. While we're all mourning the loss of loved ones, our children are being directly affected as well. And she wanted them to know that God cares about them. So right now, I'm thankful that Leslie Ann had this burden on her heart to share a special message with our children today about grief. So bring your children close and let them hear an encouraging word on this amazing Sabbath. God bless you. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. You know, I said happy Sabbath, but honestly, I don't feel that happy. There has been a lot of death and sadness lately. A few weeks ago, we learned that one of our friends lost her mother and her brother is very sick. Some of you have lost grandparents, aunts, uncles, and have friends whose family members have died. It really hurts when someone you love dies, doesn't it? You cry and cry and ask Jesus, why did this happen? Sometimes you feel so sad, you wonder if Jesus even cares about you at all. Well, the Bible tells us that he does. In fact, the Bible tells us that when Jesus' friend Lazarus died, Jesus cried too. It says so right here in Matthew 11. Jesus felt so sad in his heart, Jesus cried. You know what that means? That means that Jesus understands when we are sad and in understanding he cares when i feel sad music helps me feel better now there are many types of songs that help but when i'm really really sad nothing works better than a hymn so i'm going to teach you a hymn that helps me does jesus care Parents, if you know it, you can sing along. It goes like this. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the
now that you've heard it, let's sing that chorus one more time together. Ready? beautiful knowing that Jesus heart is touched when I am sad and that he cares makes me feel better when you are sad this hymn can help you too it's number 181 in the hymnal just ask your parents to help you understand the grown-up words learn it and sing it whenever you feel sad to remind yourself that Jesus feels sad when you are sad and he cares. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we are sad that so many people are sick and dying. Thank you for showing us that you are sad when we are sad. Thank you for caring. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, CPC. I don't care where you are. Clap your hands like this. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. He's moving in this house and in your house too. Just repeat after me. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Says, 
for I reckon that the suffering of this present time cannot be compared to the glory somebody say glory right where you are which will be revealed one day he's coming back listen there's no God like Jehovah 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 like there's no God like Jehovah like there's no God like Jehovah like there's no God like Jehovah stay right there say it again there's no God like Jehovah nobody like Jehovah who can come here no one dares Nobody like him. I searched high and I searched low. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. I keep looking. I keep looking. And I can't find nobody. Nobody. Thank you, Tim, for leading us in praise and worship, and thank you for uh, your ability to prepare us for prayer. Uh, and now is that opportunity that we have as a royal priesthood to approach the throne of grace, to spend time in prayer. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful that God hears and answers prayer, that, that God is willing to hear from the likes of us. I'm not perfect. I don't know about you today. But I'm not perfect, and I'm just grateful that God hears and answers prayer. And it's a wonder we don't do more of it. We used to sing songs that said, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Sometimes I fear that we've become so practical that we forget to pray that we focus so much on the literal, on, the, on the, the temporal, on the resources that we can see, that we forget the importance of prayer, the power of faith. And so today we get to do that, and I'm excited that we are blessed by a God who hears and answers prayer. I want you to bow your head with me as we pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the blessing of life. Thank you for hearing and answering prayer. Thank you for not doing away with us as you could have. 
realizing that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, you could have scrapped this whole thing and started over, but your patience has, has kept us, your long-suffering nature has kept us and provided for us, protected us. You've been so good to give us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to get it right. We're exhausted from work, from stress, from the last two years of this pandemic, from tragedy after tragedy and trauma after trauma. And we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with the invigorating power of your Holy Spirit, that you would overshadow and overwhelm our spiritual, emotional, and physical fatigue, that you would invigorate us, that you would give us life, and that we would be once again excited, joyful, overjoyed about the presence and power and work of God in our lives and in the world. We want to be your hands and feet. And so, God, I pray that you would show us, each one of us individually, what we can do to enlarge your kingdom, to be a blessing to others, to share others, to share with others the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for our community, praise church family. We pray for every person who's dealing with illness, that, Lord, you would be a healer, realizing that there is no one better to heal the body than the one who created it. And the Bible reminds us that in the beginning, you made us, you created these bodies from the dust. You know them inside and out. And whether you choose to use the miracle of medicine or whether you choose to simply speak a word and heal that way, God, we trust you. We give ourselves over to you. Help us to cooperate with you. Help us to take care of our bodies the way that we should to rest and to take, and to take those measures that are necessary to maintain life and health and to maintain longevity for our families. We pray, Lord, for the seniors of our church, that God, you would continue to keep them there, the foundation on which we build. And we thank you for their ministry, for their sacrifice, for their example, for their witness to us. And we pray that you would bless them beyond measure as they continue to give us counsel and, and advise us as we continue to live in these days. We're praying, Lord, for our children and for our marriages, for the singles of our church. We pray for every relationship, every friendship, that, Lord, you would bind us together with the cords of Christian love, that we would see one another as children of the living God, without judgment, but with compassion and understanding. We're praying, Father, that you would be with all of those that are wrestling through bouts of, of depression and, and anxiety and discouragement, that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. We're praying that you would continue to lead us in our mission to share the gospel of Jesus with the world. We want the end to come. We want to be ready when you come. But God, we also know that part of the reason you've delayed your coming is because we're just not doing enough to spread the gospel. And so, Lord, help us as individuals to have a burden for souls, to want to share with our co-workers and friends and loved ones about the love and grace and soon return of Jesus Christ. We pray for the sermon series that is to begin today, that God, you would bless it, that it would change the way that we think, the way that we operate, the way that we live, so that we can be more effective in sharing Jesus in these last days. And then God, we pray that when you come, you would save us in your eternal kingdom. And we ask it in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you so much, Pastor Johnston, for leading us uh, into this moment where we get to dig into the Word of God. I am thrilled that we're able to start this teaching series today entitled Church Redefined. And we begin with a message entitled Risky Business. Uh, and we find ourselves in the Gospel of John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 20 to 28. That's our key focus today from the title Risky Business. Before we start, would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, give us clarity, give us understanding, give us boldness to live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Risky business. John chapter 12, verse 20 leads us this way. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. 
they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, uh, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, watch this, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Risky business. The last couple of years of this pandemic have been challenging for the landscape of church. Everything has changed, and I have to be very transparent with you because you are my church family. It has been a rewarding couple of years being here in ministry with you, but it's also been almost two of the most frustrating years in ministry. Because while so many of us that have pastored for the last 10, 15, 20 years are, are, are learning to shift and we're learning to adjust and pivot in this new landscape of ministry, it's frustrating because everything has changed. What has been normal for not just my, my ministry, I watched my father do ministry for 30 some years. And what has been normal for me was also somewhat normal for him and the generations before. Then suddenly in 2020, there was a dynamic shift in the entire landscape of church ministry. How we do ministry, how we view ministry, how we think ministry, everything changed. And earlier this week, we talked about change in grace points. And I just I shared with you that I deal pretty well with change. I don't always like it, but I like the outcome of change. And while some of the changes have been challenging over this last couple of years of a global pandemic, they've also been good changes, rewarding changes. But the church still has a long way to go. And honestly, we have to see church redefined. We have to redefine our relationships. We have to redefine our methodologies. We have to redefine our focus. So here's where we begin. John chapter 12, verse 20 sees us uh, 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 experiencing uh, a conversation with Jesus. Uh, the preceding verses in John chapter 12 uh, share with us the preamble to the crucifixion. What comes before the crucifixion? And I just want to teach you today. So allow me just to have a casual conversation. It, 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 it is the preamble to the crucifixion. What begins the journey of the last days of Jesus on earth? Verses 1 through 11 detail the account of Mary anointing the feet of Jesus in preparation for the crucifixion. And then verses 12 to 19 bring Christ's triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem. Now, once we've experienced the entrance, his feet have been anointed, he's been prepared for the crucifixion by, by the anointing of his feet. He now comes in as they wave palm branches, as he rides on this donkey coming in and they're waving and saying, Hosanna, as he comes into the city. Now there is a shift in the earthly ministry of Jesus is late in the game. I want you to get it. He's already been doing ministry now for three and a half years. It's late in the game. These are the final minutes of the last quarter of the earthly ministry of Jesus. And now there's a game changer. There's a shift in the ministry paradigm of Jesus. What do I mean by that? The Bible says in verse 12, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. You would assume that this is an everyday occurrence, but it's not. Remember, from his birth, Jesus has, has been entrenched in a Jewish society. In fact, his ministry has been primarily to the Jews. In fact, Jesus himself will say at some point that he has been sent to the lost sheep 
of Israel. But understand this, it's not unusual for Greeks to be present during this kind of celebration in Jerusalem. In fact, many from around the region would come to witness and experience from a distance the grand spectacle and culture of the Jewish people during the time of Passover. They're there because they want to experience it. They want to see what's happening. They want to be entrenched in the culture. They want to smell the smells. They want to eat the food. They want to see the people dressed as they go to, to sacrifice. They want to see all of this from a distance because they're only allowed in the outer temple, in the outer courtyard, rather, of the temple. But they're there just the same. Understand when it comes to Greek culture that Greeks were travelers, that they were wanting to experience the wonders of the world. But they weren't just travelers. They weren't just those on a constant, a constant journey of wanderlust. No, they were also seekers of truth. I want you to understand this about the Greeks, that they are people that would move from one philosophy to the next, from one religion to the next, and even from one teacher to the next, all in search of truth. And now they've come to Jerusalem and they see someone named Philip and Philip is a Greek name. And so maybe there's some familiarity there. Maybe there's a level of comfort with Philip and they come to him and they make the simple request, we would like to see Jesus. Whew. I want you to understand, can I just pause parenthetically for a moment and help you understand that during a global pandemic, there has been a rise in a search for, spiritual, uh, for, for a spiritual foundation. People are seeking an answer and seeking comfort and seeking counsel. And now we are in a position when people are coming to the church to say, we would like to see Jesus. Philip is a Greek name. Philip doesn't necessarily know, uh, uh, know what to do with the request, even though they've come to him because of that Greek name and because of the familiarity. Philip doesn't actually know what to do, so he goes to Andrew. Andrew has no doubt in his mind. Andrew says, let's take him to Jesus. And so watch this. Christ's growing popularity is drawing Greeks to Jerusalem. Oh, do you see it? His growing popularity, this fact that word is getting around, gossip is getting around, that Jesus has walked on some water. I heard he turned some water to wine. I heard recently that this guy named Lazarus actually died and they buried him. And Jesus went while he was already smelling and told him to come out. And this dead guy got up. We heard recently that, that Jesus went into the temple because there were a bunch of people hustling folk and there were a bunch of money changers that were, that were swindling people. And we heard that this young Jesus went in and started throwing over tables and whipping stuff and driving people out. And understand that his, this recent surge in his popularity is drawing people in. They've heard about the miracles and the awesome display of power with Jesus, but they've also heard of his boldness and his unapologetic attack on the establishment. And they want to meet Jesus. Oh. They're not there for the show. They're not there for, for, for the infrastructure or the system or, 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 or any of that. They want to meet Jesus. Can I just pause for a moment? I know I'm supposed to be teaching you. I'm trying to keep calm on this thing. But can I just pause for a moment and tell you that when people come to the church, they're not looking for your structure and your infrastructure and your boards and your committees. They're not looking for all of the outstanding things that we have done. They are looking to meet Jesus. Woo! I'm not saying that those other things don't have their place. They have their place. They're necessary. The church needs to be organized in order to be efficient and effective. But what they're really looking for, what they're searching for, are people who have a love for Jesus, who have the light of Jesus Christ shining from their lives. They're looking for loving people, a community, acceptance. They just want to meet Jesus. Woo! I want you to get this thing. When they come to the people that are following Jesus, what they want is an encounter, a meeting with the Savior. They want to see Jesus. 
I want you to write this down. This is important. Let me, let me, let me get back in teaching mode here. Let me, let me calm down. Uh, I want you to write this down because this is very important. When it says they wanted to see Jesus, the Greek, tra- the, the, the Greek translation of these words, these, these verbs for see, carry within them great importance because it refers to not just wanting to have an audience with Jesus. They want to talk to him. Ah, but get this, not just talk to him, they want to ask questions of him. Remember, these are Greeks. They they are students of philosophy and religion and various teachers. They are seekers of truth. And so when they say we want to see Jesus, they don't just want an audience with him. They want to have a conversation with him. They want to ask questions of him. But get this. The verbs for, 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 for see carry within them even more meaning because it, has a, it, 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 it moves even on a different level, on a deeper level. Because it's not just wanting to have a conversation or ask questions. What they are doing is they're saying, they want, they're saying, we want to see Jesus. These Greek verbs literally sometimes mean for them an invitation to believe. Mm. Write that down. An invitation to believe. These are foreigners who are ready, get this, they are ready to believe in Jesus. They're not just there for, for a theological discourse. They're not just there to argue or to go back and forth. They are ready to believe in Jesus, ready to join Jesus. These foreigners These Gentiles, watch this CPC family, these Gentiles are God-fearers. I want you to see it. They have no association with Jewish culture. They have not been raised under the understanding of Yahweh or, or, or the understanding of Jehovah. They have not understood the works and writings and laws of Moses. What they have heard is that Jesus changes lives. What they have heard is that Jesus raises from the dead. What they have heard is that Jesus decides to associate with the lowest of the low in community. And what they want to know is we want to have a conversation with him. We want to ask questions of him because we are prepared already to believe him and to follow him. And CPC family, church dynamics must shift understanding that there are people outside of the walls or even outside of the virtual community of church that are already being prepared by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus. No, they haven't been introduced to the health message yet. No, they haven't been introduced to the Sabbath yet. No, they haven't been introduced to the state of the dead yet. But what they do know is that over the last two years, my life has been turned upside down and I've lost my job or I've lost my family members or I'm going through bereavement and my mental health is off. And I heard about somebody named Jesus Christ and I heard I could find him at your church. We have to be bold enough. Thank you, Jesus. We have to be bold enough, bold enough to share Jesus, Jesus in his purest form, Jesus, the the sacrificial lamb, Jesus, the lamb, the, 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 the word made flesh, the lamb slain, Jesus, the lily of the valley and bright and morning star. Who is he? I'm so glad you asked. He's, he's Mary's baby, Jesus. He's my helper. He's my friend. He's my confidant, Jesus. We have to be willing, ah, we have to be willing to share Jesus. Uh, now watch this. Uh, here, let me, let, me, let, me, let me help you understand this. Uh, these are God-fearers, but they are Greeks, not associated with, with Israel, but now foreigners are looking to connect with Jesus. Hmm. And this has problematic implications. What are they? I'm so glad you asked. It has problematic implications because Israel is radically dedicated to racial purity. Did you get what I said? Israel is radically dedicated to racial purity. 
questioning any relationship where they will intermarry, where Israel will marry with Philistines or, or with Amalekites or with anyone who might be an enemy of God's people. They, they are not in support of the blending of races or the mixing of blood or, or, even, the, or, or even allowing Greeks into the innermost parts of their sacrificial system. To move past the outer court of the temple for Greeks would be a capital punishment, a capital offense. And so Israel is fiercely, radically dedicated to racial purity. And up until now, Jesus has been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. So when now Greeks come and approach Jesus... This is a turning point in his ministry because for Jesus to connect with foreigners is a risky move. In a short period of time, the, the, the popularity of Christ has skyrocketed and now everything is at risk. He's gotten so popular that foreigners are coming to Israel looking for Jesus and this is going to be risky because they're outsiders in Jewish culture. Because the people uh, are, are not, are not uh, within the, the, the society of the, one that, of the ones that Jesus, that, that God sent Jesus to be a part of, to save, to, to be the word made flesh, to show them God in the flesh. And so now those that are in the outside are coming in. That's, that's problematic. When people outside start coming in. Hmm. Let me tell you something as an introvert and all my other intro introverts can, can relate. Introverts need boundaries. I'm just telling you like it is. I love people. I love being around people. I love ministering to people. But, I, but, but after all of that is poured out, I need to be alone for it to be poured back in. And I have sacred spaces. Not at the church. I'm talking about my office at home. Whatever you want to call it. I have sacred spaces. And sometimes I'm anxious when other people come in while I'm trying to replenish. Understand that all of us struggle when outsiders come in. And sometimes we struggle even in the church. The problem is these Greeks have approached Philip in order to find an entry wedge to meet Jesus. And Philip didn't know what to do. So he went to Andrew and Andrew said, let's take them to Jesus. And Jesus response is this, my hour has come. Yeah. The moment Greeks start looking for Jesus, Jesus says, all right, it's time. We're ready to go. Because the coming of the Greeks, it was in a sense confirmation of the Pharisees concern that the world was going to go after Jesus. More than that, it's a strategic turning point in the ministry of Jesus. Because up until this point, the Pharisees are saying the whole world is going to be going after him. And we need to maintain, we need to defend the racial purity of our people. And they're worried that Jesus is going to invite riffraff and, and he's going to invite foreigners into our sacred spaces. But it's also a turning point for Jesus. And Jesus identifies the moment that Gentiles come seeking him as his hour. Whew. Do you understand what's happening here? The moment foreigners start looking for Jesus, Jesus says, my hour has come. Christ's ministry was always to extend beyond Jerusalem. And now his hour had come. But this type of global popularity doesn't produce in him a greater need to be more influential or a greater need for a larger, a larger throng or a larger ministry or a larger platform. Instead, when, the, when Gentiles, when Greeks come searching for Jesus, what it has done is triggered his hour of sacrifice. Larger ministry leads to greater sacrifice. Ah, did you get it? The greater the ministry of your church, the greater your, the ministry of your life, the greater the sacrifice that will be required. 
One more time for those of you that missed it. The greater the ministry of your church, as the platform of your church grows, and all of our churches have grown, the platform has grown during the pandemic. All of us, all of a sudden, became televangelists. We all of a sudden became churches that were on YouTube and, and Facebook and everything else. And, and there were people that were viewing from all over the world. The larger the ministry, the greater the sacrifice. For so many of you, this has been a time of great contemplation, a, a time of great self-evaluation. And for some of you, your ministry has grown. The larger your ministry, the greater the sacrifice. So understand this. Verses 23 to 26 tell us Christ's response. Let's go back there. Let's read that together. Turn in your Bibles. I'm reading from the, the, the NIV. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12, and we're going to read together. I'm going to read in your hearing verses 23 to 26. Okay, watch this. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. The man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. My father will honor the one who serves me. Follow me, follow me. I want you to get this. In these verses, Jesus has defined the need for sacrifice. Now's the time, he says, now that we have the attention of the world, the outside world, because before... It was, it was Jews and a smattering of other cultures within. But now that we have arrested the attention of the outside world, the hour has come to be sacrificed so all the world can see that I'm the lamb slain. This is the signal that in order for Jesus to achieve his purposes of making God known, he, like a grain of wheat, has to fall to the ground and die. The widening ministry of Jesus brings the cross, it brings risk. The widening ministry of Jesus triggers the cross. It brings risk. I want you to get this as we, as we dig into this idea of church redefined. Um, church is risky business. Mm. The truth is we're prone to see church as a safe place for community, for fellowship, for prayer, for praise, for preaching. And, and honestly, all of those things are important, and that's what church is. All of those things are important, and they have their place. But church, the church is the radical, write this down, the church is the radical extension of the ministry of Jesus, and it's risky business. Church is not a safe space. It should be a safe space for our relationships with one another, a safe space to share our hurt, our pain, our feelings with one another, a safe space where we know people will pray for us. But understand that church itself is the radical extension of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus Christ, and it is risky business. We have a kingdom priority, a kingdom focused paradigm. It's not just about fellowship and community, prayer, praise, and preaching, even though those things are important and powerful. Church, again, I got to repeat this, repetition deepens the impression. Church is the radical extension of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and it is risky business. What do I mean by that? The ministry of Christ is not a clean, logical, or practical ministry. I got to say it again. The ministry of Christ is not a clean, logical, or practical ministry. It doesn't depend on what men and women think or the plans that we devise. It is driven by the power of the Holy Spirit and empowered by faith and imbued with power, endued with power through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on ministry. It's not clean. It's not logical. It's not practical. You need examples? Jesus walks on water. It's not logical. 
He raises people from the dead. He feeds large crowds with no money and no preparation. He associates with known felons. He speaks out against religious leaders in power. He touches lepers without gloves or protection. And he confronts demons. This is not a clean, logical, or practical style of ministry. Christ ministry is risky business. And authentic church ministry is risky business as well. The kingdom-focused church can't, watch this, I'm about to get myself in trouble for this, but just bear with me. The kingdom-focused church can't always be both clean and Christ-like. Did you get it? The kingdom-focused church cannot always be clean and Christ-like. And when I say clean, we're not talking about morality versus immorality. We're not talking about sin and righteousness. We're talking about getting our hands dirty, doing things that may not look orthodox, doing things that may depart from what is acceptable, uh, the acceptable norm for church, or, or, or associating with people that may sully the name of the church. Jesus did it. Why is the church afraid to do it? Is the church afraid to take risks? Maybe we are. And if we're afraid to take risks, then we're not doing the authentic ministry of Jesus. Because the kingdom-focused church cannot always be clean and still be Christ-like. It's a radical approach to church. Risky business of church is radically inclusive discipleship. Let me say it again. The risky business of church, write it down. The risky business of church is radically inclusive discipleship. Some things in the church actually have to die in order to produce fruit. That's what Jesus says. He says, watch this, verses 23 and 24. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Sometimes the things in church have to die to produce fruit. And the church has to adopt the risky business of the ministry of Jesus. Why is it so risky? Let me make sure that you get this. The church cannot always be both productive and practical. Remember I told you before that the church can't always be both clean and Christ-like. But now understand that the church can also, can't always be both productive and practical. Sometimes in order for us to be productive, we have to rely on faith more so than our research and what we've done. Because the last time we saw someone researching what they were going to do as far as the power of God, it was the children of Israel when they scouted out the Canaan land and they came back and they, after doing their research, they said that they were larger than us. They were giants. We were grasshoppers in our own sight and we can't do it. And that's a practical assumption. That's, that's the right evaluation. But no one called you to see it with, with practical eyes. Church has to be an experience of faith, believing in what God can do over what our resources can do or over what the enemy presents to us. We have to be willing to be, to be productive sometimes it, when it flies in the face of practicality. If the church does not take risks to give eternal life to a dying world, then it will be at risk of dying itself. Let me say it again. If the church does not take risks to give eternal life to a dying world, then the church will be at risk of dying itself. Being the kind of church that embodies the, wor the work of Christ will risk some things. It'll be risky business. You'll risk, number one, reputation. Write these down. When we do ministry, and again, over the last two years, we have realized that the way we always did it is no longer effective and we have to change. Church is being redefined. 
And so now for us to do some things to reach people for Jesus, to reach people who have no association with Christianity or even Seventh-day Adventism or God himself, to reach those people, we will sometimes risk reputation. Jesus, when the Greeks come to him, is now at risk of losing his newfound popularity by connecting his ministry with foreigners. I can imagine some of the practical followers of Jesus are coming to him when he's approached by these God-fearing Greeks. And they're saying, Jesus, don't get too close to them. You can't be seen publicly having conversations with them. Your popularity is rising. You're finally in a position for political power in Israel, and you can't be seen with Greeks. But to do ministry to save the world, Jesus is willing to risk reputation. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we more committed? Watch this, CPC. I'm going to get myself in trouble again. Are we more committed to maintaining to to the radical commitment of denominational purity or discipling people? I got to ask that question again. Are we more committed to the radical idea? Are we more radically committed rather to the idea of denominational purity than, than we are to discipling people? Because here's what the Bible tells us in Revelation. It shows Jesus as the one who walks between the seven golden lampstands. It literally means that Jesus is the one who maintains his church. So if we're more committed to denominational purity than we are to discipling people, we are no longer doing the work that Christ has called us to do. Because Revelation reminds us that Jesus will maintain his church. Jesus will separate the wheat from the tear. Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. We have to be concerned with discipling people and let Jesus maintain his his church. Let Jesus maintain the standards of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Let Jesus maintain Christianity as a whole. We can't be more committed to denominational purity than we are to discipling people. Because the denomination is still under the authority of Jesus. And it's not your job to fix it. And if we did fix it, we'd break it. This is God's church, and he will maintain it. Number one, Jesus is willing to risk reputation, but when you do risky business ministry, you will risk relationships. Literally, when the Greeks come to Jesus, it triggers the final moments leading to the crucifixion. Jesus says, my hour is come. It's here. It's time. It's happening, people. This is not a drill. This is real. Christ followers, when this happens, will eventually leave him. Some of his very disciples will deny him. Another will betray him. And if we are obedient enough to welcome those seeking Christ, we might lose relationships and even influence. Get it again. I didn't say bold enough. I said, if we are obedient enough to welcome those seeking Jesus from different walks of life, people that we have no common, not, nothing in common with except that we're all a part of the human family, we might lose relationships or even influence. This goes beyond just the realm of denomination. This goes beyond the realm of Christian versus uh, atheism or anything else. This goes beyond the realm uh, of, of what works and what doesn't. This even goes to the realm of race. One person said once that the most segregated, segregated hour in the country is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. But at Seventh-day Adventist, it may be the same for us on a Sabbath morning. And I'm not just talking about black and white. We separate over worship styles. We separate over theological differences within the same church. We separate over the place of women in ministry or the place of children or the place of youth. We separate over what type of ministry is appropriate for youth to engage in. And we don't even understand their generation. But when we are obedient enough to welcome those seeking Jesus, we might lose relationships. We might lose reputation. We might risk relationship. And lastly, we risk retribution. We risk retribution. See, the risky business of ministry of the ministry of Christ literally put his life in danger. Religious leadership plots to end his life 
to stop his work. And this is what we have to understand. We will face backlash from people, organizations, and even church leaders when we adopt a risky methodology of ministry. This is what Monty Celine says in uh, the, the work Adventist Congregations Today. He says, what works for Adventist church growth today is a congregation that gets involved constructively in local community, providing significant services outside of its own self-interest, as well as providing a growing spiritual experience for its members and becoming intentional about a, about a, a, strate- a strategy for growth. Now get this, I underline this part. The most effective arena for public evangelism is worship services designed, watch this, designed for the unchurched. The majority of Americans who do not regularly go to church, most of whom dropped out of church or as as teens or young adults, some coming from an entirely secular background, both sharing an essential uh, both sharing, both sharing rather, an essentially secular worldview. He says that the most effective way for us to reach people is to design worship services, not for us, not for the tithe payer, not for the one who complains, not for the most influential members in the church or the ones with the loudest voices or the ones who have been there the longest or to maintain the legacy of who we've always been. No, he says the one, the church, uh, the, the most effective way of evangelism is a church church that will design worship for the unchurched, for the people who left church, who have no association with church. We risk reputations and relationships and even retribution when we do risky ministry. But get this, we gain a reward. We may risk reputation, relationships, and and retribution, but we gain reward. This is what the Bible says in John chapter 12, verses 25 and 26. Read it with me. Go there in your Bibles. It says, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Listen, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Get that last part. My father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus says that the one who hates his life uh, for my sake will gain eternal life. And the one who serves me will follow me that where I am, they'll be too. And he's not just talking about uh, where, where we are in ministry. He says the way that I do things, they'll be with me. And where I go, they'll go with me. But he's also referencing that where I am, there ye may be also. You know that verse. That when Jesus comes, we will be rewarded. And he says, my father will honor the one who serves me. God honors those who take risks. We have, we will have to rather risk relationships, risk reputation, even risk retribution to reach people for Jesus. But the Bible says there will be rich reward. In order for us to move forward, there must be a deliberate transformation of the mind. There's a book that talks about church ministry and it gives five essentials to the mission of the church. Five non-negotiables to church ministry and they are the church must be creative. The church has to be connected. They have to be consistent. They have to be courageous and they have to be compassionate. Creative, connected, consistent, uh, courageous, creative, and compassionate. This is all important for us, that we have to act out the radical love of Jesus Christ, actually expecting God to do what he promised he would do. And here's the reality. Uh, we, We don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what God is calling you to risk. I don't know what God is telling you, what risk God is telling you to take. Your spouse can't tell you that. Your, I can't tell you that. The pastoral staff can't tell you that. That answer will only come in, in prayer. 
And I don't know what it will look like for the church, for your own personal ministry. I don't know what, what work we will have to do, what ministry we will have to do. I don't know how dirty things will get for your life or how dirty things will get for the church. What I do know is the greatest fruit, the best fruit, still grows out of dirt. The best fruit of your life is still going to grow from the dirt. The best ministry that God will give us, Community Praise Church, is going to grow from us taking risks, from us rolling up our sleeves and getting our hands dirty. The greatest fruit will come from dirt. And I'm so grateful that God is calling us to the risky business of kingdom ministry so that the end can come. And I believe Jesus is soon to come, don't you? I want to be ready. Would you bow your head with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we're grateful that you've allowed us this opportunity to engage in risky business. And we know that these risks are real. The ministry you're calling for us to do may not always be easy, may not always look polished, may not always work the way that we want it to, but we have to be willing to take the risk so that others would see Jesus. The hour has come. Some things in church over the last two years have died so that other things could live. So many parts of what we thought were normal have passed over this last two years, but what has come from it is more innovative thinking, newer methods for ministry. We are now embracing technology so that we can spread Jesus around the globe. Some seeds have to die so that many seeds can live. And God, I don't know what you're calling each and every one who's listening to risk today. I don't know what work you're calling them to do. Some of them are stagnant in this place right now. They're in a standstill because they don't want to take the risk. Brother or sister, I don't know what risk God is calling you to take. I do know that when you are obedient to the word of God, he will always give reward. It will be fruitful. It shall bear fruit. And CPC, I don't know what risk God is calling us to take. What I do know is that if we are obedient, the work he calls us to do in these last days will bear fruit. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to your call. In Jesus' name, amen.
CPC, I pray that you've been blessed. My heart is full and I pray that your heart is full as well. Thank you, Tim and our praise team for leading us today. Thank you, Dr. Lola Moore Johnston, Pastor Johnston, for leading us in that dynamic song. Oh, just a blessing to experience your voice. And we're looking forward next month to hearing you preach. I'm excited. We'll give you more about that uh, as the days come, as the in the days ahead. We want to make sure that you stay up to date with what's happening. So please, please, please make sure that you are paying attention to the announcements every Sabbath so you know what's happening at the Community Praise Church. Thank you to our media team. Thank you, Daryl and our band. Every Sabbath, we're so blessed. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. And thank you to each one of you for watching every Sabbath, for spending time with us, even virtually in worship, and for being so generous in supporting the ministry of CPC. It's because of your generosity that we can continue to do this virtually and spread the gospel around the DMV and around the country and around the world. Why? Because we want Jesus to come and you're a part of that. And if you'd like to be able to partner with us and you haven't been able to do it, or if you'd like to be able to give, you can go to cpcsda.org forward slash give. And there you'll find our giving portal and you'll be able to partner with us in giving. You'll see all of the lines where you can contribute. We want you to give a faithful tithe and a sacrificial offering. And we thank you again for what you're doing to support the ministry of the Community Praise Church. I'm so glad that God loves me and I'm so grateful that he loves you too. And I pray that we are challenged to look at church as risky business and that we would take the risk that God is telling us to take in our own lives to share the word of God with the world around us, to go higher in our divine purpose, and to hasten his soon coming. So until next week, when we see you again and we continue our series entitled Church Redefined, go tell the world about Jesus. Tell them about his love. God bless each and every one of you. Happy Sabbath. As you go, as you go, tell the world. Yeah.